In last few decades, minimum feature size of transistors has reduced from 10 micrometer to much less than 10 nanometer. The main purpose of continuous scaling of device dimension was to improve device as well as IC performance and to pack more devices in the same area. As a result of scaling, cost per transistor has reduced drastically. However, as the technology node has moved forward, issues related to interconnect has become bottleneck for IC performance. In today's episode, we will discuss about interconnects in VLSI and their impact on design and performance of ICs. If you are interested, stay tuned till the end of the video. Now let's move to the pointers we will cover in this episode. First, basic of VLSI interconnects. Next, VLSI interconnect, local and global. Third, desirable or expected VLSI interconnect. Next, real or fabricated VLSI interconnect. Then, interconnect parasitics in VLSI, back end of line or BEOL. Resistance and reliability, capacitance and reliability, inductance and reliability, and finally, impact of scaling. So, let's move to the first slide. Basic of VLSI interconnects. In a IC or integrated circuit, active designs and regions are electrically connected to each other to make circuit. When these active regions or devices are isolated, they cannot work as a circuit. So they need to be connected and that connect is called interconnects. And these interconnection of active regions, when they will perform, they must connect to the outside world through their input and output warning pads so that we can insert input data and get the desired result from the circuit. So that is the need of interconnects. So active devices and regions in IC are electrically connected to each other to make circuit. They are also connected to the outside world through their input and output on bonding pads. Contacts, vias and interconnects used for such connections. Depending on the position of the electrical connection, we call them as contacts or vias or interconnects. Next, contact is connection to source drain and poly. This is source to drain. This is the channel region and this is the contact to the active region. This is the gate region. When the contacts or the electrical connections are directly to the active region like source, drain or poly, we call this contact. Next, via. As we can see in this diagram, this is via. Connections between interconnect levels. This is the metal 1 level, this is metal 2 level. As the technology has progressed, the number of metal layer has increased. Complexity of design has increased. Complexity of connection has increased. So, metal layers has also increased. Between interconnect levels, the connection is called via. And interconnects are separated from each other by dielectric layers. So these are not actually in the vacuum. This area, this area are oxide are there. Dielectric layers separating global interconnect levels are called IMD or intermetal dielectric or ILD or interlevel dielectrics. These are basically the nomenclature of dielectric layer to separate it from the gate level. Next, vias connect interconnects through these layers. Obviously, as we can see, these are perpendicularly. Metal is uh, running from left to right or any um, in lateral direction and vias are perpendicular to it. These components are part of metallization or backend or BEOL. We will elaborate this point. It's very important point that BEOL, when chip is fabricated, first the active regions are fabricated. Then these, these local, these are local connects. These are local connections are made. And then after that last come this metallization process. Fabrication of device is known as the FEOL, front end of line. These all metal interconnects making is called back end of line. Chip surface doesn't have enough space for all connections, so vertical interconnects are built. Active regions are laterally fabricated on the chip surface, so on that these connections are built. Number of metal layers increases with IC complexity. Technology is progressing. Device numbers are increasing because we want to realize more complex functionality and number of metal layer also increasing accordingly. Aluminium interconnects were used as the standard for long time in chip making and it's uh, sometimes still it's used. 
In the late 90s, chip makers switched to CU because it conducts electricity better than aluminium. CU interconnects improved IC performance and can match transistor scaling. This whole fabrication method and nodes that's followed Moore's law in last few decades to increase the number of transistor in the same area, device dimension have been scaled. So when device dimension is scaled, obviously this via this connect, this also have to be scaled. Otherwise, it will be a kind of this kind of structure. If contact is like this wider, make contact with half, half with the source region, some with the drain region, then uh, it will not get proper uh, connection or proper signal will not go to the upper level. So obviously the metal layer need to be scaled down along with the devices. So obviously we need a material which can match the transistor scaling. Let's move to the next slide. VLSI interconnects local and global. This is the diagram. Well, there are two types of interconnects. Depending on their position, we call it local and global. Look at this diagram. It will help you to understand. This is the silicon layer. These active regions, they are up to this zone. That is the FUL, front end of line. And then back end of line, this one. There are three parts, local, intermediate and global shown, although we will cover it like local and global. Intermediate uh, layer is very small here. The steps to fabricate this active region and these interconnects are completely different. Their position is different and that's why there are some, some issues and concerns are there which are also different for these two layers. Local interconnects are the first or lowest level of interconnects. This is... This is the lowest local. These are short. They cover short distances. They connect gate sources and drains in MOS technology and emitters base and collectors in bipolar technologies. Local interconnects are small and short. Polysilicon, silicide, titanium nitride, tungsten can act as local interconnects. There are many choices for interconnect material. The reason is behind is that, that local interconnects can afford to have higher resistivity since they do not travel very long distances, but they must also be able to withstand higher processing temperature. Now, there are two very crucial points. Local interconnects, as we said, they are very small and they run for short distances. If resistivity of a wire is higher, heating can happen. Longer the length of the wire and higher resistive material, then obviously it will resist the current more. For local interconnects, we must choose a material which can withstand higher processing temperature. Temperature handling capability of that material with which we are manufacturing these local interconnects is higher, then it can handle higher temperature of fabrication of this process or this area. While we are fabricating all these steps, these metal layers, if metal layer or interconnect layer here, here will break down then there is no point of it making or doing that because uh, that's a fail chip it will not work accordingly global interconnects are usually made of aluminium they are above local interconnects obviously physically we can see they are above local interconnect level Global interconnects are thick, long and widely spaced. They often travel over large distances between different devices, different parts of the circuit and therefore they always they are always metal with lower resistivity. They run longer distances from one corner to other corner. So if resistivity is higher, that resistivity of the material will resist the current and also heating will be there. So let's move to the next slide. Now, desirable and expected VLSI interconnects. We have some ideal assumptions like wire only connects functional elements and does not affect design performance. It's absolutely wrong. They have a huge impact on design performance or chip performance. And that's why we are dis uh, discussing this topic today here. A voltage changes at one end appears at the other end without any delay. That is where is an equal potential region. We think that it's instantaneous. That's not. Obviously, a function of time, a function of frequency. These are the basically ideal assumptions. In reality, it doesn't happen. There are a list of desirable properties of interconnects. 
low electrical resistivity it's uh, always good to have lower electrical resistivity low capacitance that is low dielectric constant for low rc delay crosstalk power loss high electromigration resistance what is electromigration we will uh, discuss it later electromigration is a reliability issue for interconnects occurrence of electromigration actually leads to chip failure ease of deposition of thin films of the materials sometimes we need to deposit thin film of material so not all material is good for this purpose so the metal we will use that must have that property ability to withstand the chemical and high temperatures required in fabrication process we have already covered this point in previous slide stable contact structure there should not be any kind of chemical reaction with the material with which the metal is going to get connected then there is no point because once a chemical reaction starts most of the time the resulting material will not be be that metal or that material it will be a uh, some other materials adherence to insulating films silicon dioxide is as an insulator the most choiceable one later on many other also have been added in the least although silicon dioxide is the, the most go to oxide the adherence should be good to get stick to that material low internal stress and surface roughness these are basically chemical properties when we are manufacturing an ic it's basically a lot of materials and their chemical properties and they should stay side by side to make the design work next easily etched using plasma processes that material can be easily etched using plasma process compatibility with all other semiconductor processes and finally is low cost because cost is concern next real or fabricated vlsi interconnects now let's see how real or fabricated vlsi interconnects behave in real world interconnects have resistance capacitance and inductance per unit length wiring of ic forms a complex geometry that introduces capacitive parasitics resistive parasitics and inductive parasitics all the basic rules of electrical networking get applied a real material has resistance they have some capacitance and inductance value the layer of metals they are separated by the electric layer and current value is really low when we consider the dimension of the geometry flowing current in different nearby two conductor they impact on each other what does parasitic do increases propagation delay causing a drop in performance impact on energy dissipation and power distribution if the long interconnects have all these parameters these resistive capacitive and inductive value then obviously current travel from one point one node to another node there will be some changes which is not desirable and introduces extra noise resulting in reliability of the circuit we need to model the resistive capacitive and inductive parasitics of wires and accordingly we must do our checking and steps so that the chip doesn't fail so what we do the back end in there are so many reliability steps are there that actually includes this effect of resistive capacitive and inductive parasitics so modeling of wire capacitances is a non trivial task it's a really tough work there are two types of capacitance occurring parallel plate and fringe capacitance capacitance of wire is a function of shape distance and surrounding wires and substrate the resistance of a wire is proportional to its length and inversely proportional to its cross section a we all know that r is equal to rho l by a inductance in interconnects is represented by voltage drop due to rate of change of current with time in earlier days in research only r and c components used to take uh, in consideration and later on in high frequency this l l component is also considered in doing modeling and all it's a real tough uh, modeling and uh, very necessary and very crucial now parasitic extraction that's an important part parasitic extraction there is a file format called spef s p e f parasitic values of a circuit that is written in its ieee format obviously tool generated not human written file format it's written in that file standard eda tool is used to extract parasitic values and it's a part of back end part of basically physical design parasitic extraction is to calculate the parasitics of wires and create an analog model of the circuit 
Extracted parasitics are included in timing power analysis to get more realistic result. When we consider there is no realistic hindrance like resistance, capacitance and inductance, our study is something. And when we include all this delay and all, then performance will be completely different. Before sending the final layout to the fabrication unit, we need to analyze it from all angles so that after fabrication, after putting all the money, it doesn't fail on the realistic world. The chip doesn't fail. Standard parasitic extent format is an IEEE standard for representing parasitic data of words in a cheap in ASCII format. We already have an episode on SPIF file format and its impact and importance all. Link will be given in the description. You can watch it. Now interconnect parasitics in VLSI. We said that resistive, capacitive and inductive. So this is the resistance. The resistance of a wire is rho L by A area, this cross-sectional area, the height with width. And this is the basic formula we all know. Now let's move to inductance. Inductance of a section of circuit states that a changing current passing through an inductor generates a voltage drop. That voltage drop is propor proportional to change of current with time. Delta V or change of that voltage drop is proportional to DIDT. An important source of parasitic inductance is due to bonding wires and chip packages. If that is the circuit that must be connected to the outer world so from there and this connectivity their uh, inductance value is not very very negligible and in transient and in switching mode current need to change that time that inductance comes into place again interconnect parasitics now capacitive there are two types of like parallel plate capacitance and fringing capacitance this is parallel plate capacitance this is substrate dielectric the simpler model that is C is proportional to epsilon 0 epsilon RDI that is dielectric layer divided by TDI and then WL. Width and length of the wire TDI and epsilon DI represent the thickness and dielectric layer and its permittivity. Fringing capacitance is between sidewalls of the wires and the substrate. This is the equation. So when we Consider total wire capacitance. So total wire capacitance would be fringing and parallel plate. CPP plus C fringe. This is the total. Now let's move to the next slide. Now back end of line. So let's see what are the steps by which we make these interconnect levels. The back end of line. The back end of line or BOL is a portion of IC fabrication where the wiring is done through metallization or vias including dielectric separators among various metal layers. BOL steps are like silicidation of polysilicon and source drain diffusion. It starts from there. Then adding a pre-metal dielectric or CMP processing it. It's a step. Make holes in PMD pre-metal dielectric and create contact through it. A pre-metal dielectric is fabricated and then a hole is made through it and contact is done through it. Then add metal layer 1. First metal layer is fabricated. Then add dielectric layer that is intermetal dielectric. One metal layer is fabricated. Now intermetal dielectric is done. Then through CVD makes vias through IMD. A metal layer is done and then we are adding intermetal metal dielectric. Suppose it's a metal layer and now whole area we are oxidation and now we dielectric layer is done. So even if we vertically, if that is the vertical direction, we make another layer of interconnects. We need to connect. There will be a separator. So we have to make hole through it so that this layer and that layer get connected. Carry on last three steps until all metal layer as per technology node are done. When a technology node is defined, it always the process is optimized. When a fabrication unit release their data regarding one new technology node, they include all the metal layers and everything. Last three steps means add metal layer, then add dielectric layer or IMD and then make CVD and build these vias through IMD. If 7 or 8 metal layer is there, so this process will get repeated for that many times. Then add final passivation layer to protect the chip from weather and outer world. Now BOL corners, that a very important part. What are BOL corners? Back end of line corners. It's part of RC corners or PVT corners, process voltage temperature corners. We have detailed video and articles on that so link will be given in the description i'm going to tell here in short parameters of a semiconductor fabrication are generally statistically due distributed 
because it's it's not an ideal process it's a real world not all two devices have all the properties same some variation occurs in length width oxide thickness and all since in a wafer ICs we fabricate they are not identical we must judge their merit within a range of data not a particular one data because when a device is very small in dimension half of nanometer is even crucial factor for a batch of uh, ICs we define basically a range of values and these are some corners like this extreme values some value comes from BUL steps also these are basically C worst C best CC worst RC best RC worst in detail you can read uh, the articles uh, or the watch the video so let's move to the next slide the impact of parasitics now resistance and reliability electromigration in operating condition a chip may go above 100 degrees celsius during practical operation High frequency power loss and consequent heat dissipation contributes in increased temperature. Since the interconnect have resistive properties, so heat dissipation is always there. Continuously, the temperature of the chip increases and rise in temperature enhances solid state metal ion diffusion. It's basically material level performance. So electromigration is caused by scattering of moving electrons with the ions that is by momentum transfer between electrons and ions in metal interconnects. While in operation chip temperature increases uh, depending on how long it's uh, open to that situation the moving electrons within the interconnects they scatter the ions or the metal molecules. So momentum transfer happen between electrons and ions in metal interconnects and this ion electron interaction is sometimes a referred to as electron wind. This causes the wear to break or to short circuit to another wear. Such situation create void in interconnects that can lead to open circuit. If ions from this zone is moved, either there will be a void and if it's moving, moving to and getting to another wear, so it's basically doing the short between these two. In both the cases, the electron flow or the current flow will not be in the desired direction and chip will fail. EM is one of the most menacing and persistent threat to interconnect reliability. So these are some pictures. As you can see, there is a void in PR. The electron is traveling and they, mm, you can see this zone, right? Metal layer has, if it go a little bit more, it will touch it. And there will be a short. There is no point. This black dark area is basically in intermetal dielectric. But this electro migration process is doing that. Look, it's connected. So here it's creating an open circuit. And here it's almost going to make a short circuit. So in both the cases, the chip will fail. And we have three episodes on electro migration. Link provided in description. Now, ohmic voltage drop. Current flowing through a real wire results in an ohmic voltage drop that degrades the signal levels. It's a real wire, so ohmic voltage drop will be there and degrades the signal level. Chips are basically operated at lower voltage level. Even from that, if some voltage get dropped at the interconnects, at the destination, the voltage level degraded. If it drops below the driving current of a system at the destination, the device will not perform accordingly. Suppose there is a, a signal is traveling a longer path from here to here. This is a block, that is a block. Here block 1 and that is block 2. So if this length is longer enough and voltage drop is enough, when the voltage, the signal travels from here to there, there will be a significant amount of voltage loss. And if it very higher, then sometimes it may happen that the reaching voltage of signal just fall below the switching value of components here, present here. So desirable performance we are not going to get there. The affected value of voltage reduces noise margin and changes the logic level as function of the distance from supply terminals. As the distance changes how much voltage is getting dropped there, the voltage margin level gets changed. And that change all the thing. Air drops on supply network also impact the performance of the system. A small drop in supply voltage may cause a significant increase in delay. These are the effects. Now RC delay. Signal doesn't travel in instantaneously in words and that uh, wires and delay of wire grows quadratically with, the, with its length. 
So length increases, delay also increases with that. The signal delay of long wire is dominated by RC effect. This is becoming even bigger problem in modern technology because we said the more the technology is advancing, length of interconnecting increasing and layer of metal layer has increased. This leads to situation that take multiple clock cycles to get signal from one side of a chip to its opposite end. Its delay becomes so much multiple clock cycles required to reach a signal from one corner to another corner. Next, capacitance and reliability. In real world of IC, each wire is coupled to both grounded substrate and also to the neighboring wires on some layer and on adjacent layers. Through via, the layer of interconnects are connected to each other. It's not completely isolated. So some capacitive components connect to other wires with dynamically varying voltage. Capacitive components, they are connected to other wires where the voltage level changes. So effect of that change have some impact on the capacitive components also. And such variable or floating capacitor causes crosstalk and a negative effect to the circuit. This varying capacitance value have a deep impact on the circuit performance. Delay in the signal transmission through wire is proportional to the capacitance charged. And more capacitance means more dynamic power. Coupling capacitance is an increasing source of noise and make delay estimation hard. This coupling capacitance is an increasing source of noise and makes delay estimation really hard. In a practical situation, a wire is surrounded by wires from other sides and in between dielectric layers. So, so many parallel plate capacitors in all sides and they all are within uh, ambience of IMD. When we take the whole picture, it's a very complex model. Even if all the capacitors have smaller contribution, the overall contribution and even with changing voltage, switching effect is happening, voltage level is changing because we are not designing a system for uh, keeping it idle. It will work. Voltage will, uh, voltage level will go up and down accordingly our design. When the total picture is there, it's a tough thing to calculate. What are the steps we can take to reduce interconnect capacitance? Use of low K dielectric which reduces permittivity and, and hence capacitance. Low K means lower than silicon dioxide and in high K we consider, we consider it as compared to silicon dioxide because for many years silicon dioxide has been considered as the golden one. Increase the spacing between wires. We are downsizing the transistor dimension. When we are trying to when we are trying to adjust more devices in the say in a IC or in a wafer, at that time increasing spacing is not always possible. Separating two signals with a power or ground line acting as shield that might be a method use minimum wear width wherever possible which in turn will increase the resistance r equal to rho l by a so in denominator there is a a means height into width so if width they are decreasing so r value will be increased and then the ohmic effects will be higher so we have to choose uh, between these two it's a trade off now let's move to the next slide now crosstalk. It occurs due to unwanted coupling from neighboring signal wire to a network node. The resulting disturbance acts as noise source. It's not desired. Here unwanted voltage interference is basically noise. Capacitive crosstalk is the dominant effect at current switching speed. Potential impact of capacitive crosstalk is influenced by impedance of the line under examination. The design functionality and its performance can be limited by noise. The noise impact can limit the frequency of operation of design and it can cause functional failures. Crosstalk may lead to setup or hold violation. Setup or hold violation basically two major timing violation taken care in back end timing. Then propagation delay, capacitive crosstalk may result in data dependent variation of propagation delay. Coupling capacitance is a large function of overall capacitance in the dense wire structure and of advanced technology node. This increase in capacitance is substantial and has a major impact on propagation delay of the circuit. Inductance and reliability. Inductance with LDIDT voltage drop during each switching action, a transient current is sourced from or sunk into the supply rails to charge or discharge the circuit capacitances. In our basic circuit analysis, we have studied that the transient effect happens during the switching. Here also, transistors or MOSFETs are basically used at switch. So when signal switches from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, 
transient current is sourced from a sunk into the supply rails to charge or discharge the circuit capacitances. So with that transient current actually charge, I either charge or discharge the circuit capacitances. Both VDD and VSS connections are routed to the external supplies through bonding wires and package pins and possesses a non-ignorable series inductance. That bonding wires, VDD and VSS, finally they are connected to bonding wires. They are supplied from outside. Change in transient current leads to large current surges. That's not negligible. And then transmission line effects when an interconnect becomes sufficiently long or when the circuits become sufficiently fast the inductance of wear starts to dominate delay behavior and transmission line effects become significant so actually the change of current rate of change of current that is getting resisted by the parasitics and that that is become very crucial when the wear becomes sufficiently long so if long it takes a longer time so effect will be more now, impact of scaling. Scaling is basically downsizing the device dimension. We have followed Moore's law and uh, downsized the device dimension or MOSFET di dimension and packed more devices into the same area. But that has impact on interconnects also. Here we will, in this slide, we will discuss that. Dimension of interconnect scaled down by a factor calling scaling factor. It's not abruptly changed. It's changed with a factor that is called scaling factor S. And this scaling factor is an integer. The resistance, capacitance and inductance are affected by scaling because all are function of that length, height and width. Wires, there are two types of wires, short and long. Short wires are typically used for local communication between gates, local interconnects and long wires are used for long range communication at the different corners of IC. There is a table for full level scaling, short wires and long wires and R value change with a factor of 1 by S scaling factor. And long wires, it's 1 by S square. For C, for short wires, it's S. And long wires, it's scaled by factor 1. That's same, remains same. RC delay, these are the values. And scaling with thickness, keeping thickness constant, the value will be different. So, we can see that with scaling, the value get changed. So, if we compare this RC value, RC delay value over two different technology nodes, they will be different. So that's the impact of scaling. So that we all had for today's episode. We will discuss delay models and their calculations in a later episode. Thank you for watching up to this point. Please share, subscribe and comment. In case you have any dislike or question or query, put it as comment. Thank you and bye for today.